before listening to this sermon, if you could please read Acts chapter 6 verse 8 all the way up to Acts chapter 8 verse 4. There's a link to those verses below this video. I debated before speaking this sermon if I should make you read the whole of chapter 7. But I really wanted you to appreciate that Stephen's speech was long, very long. In fact, it's, it's the longest speech in the book of Acts. Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, clearly believed that this long speech was worth repeating. God clearly wanted us to hear it in full. But why? After all, it's not the most encouraging passage in the Bible. We begin with Stephen, a much-loved member of the church, who used his time and gifts to benefit many. And yet, at the end of his long speech, no one is converted, and the church is left broken after losing someone they deeply love. All of Stephen's words were wasted. All of Stephen potentials, but Stephen's potential goes to waste. All of God's people end up hurt. And around the world, this same story is repeated hundreds of times a day. Christians share the gospel and no one listens. Churches watch as their ministers and members are killed. We're warned in advance that this is going to happen, and yet Stephen's story ends like this. Chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Why? Why speak for Jesus when no one is listening? Why not spare yourself the consequences and stay quiet? Why invest the effort? Why waste your breath? Why risk the repercussions? Why step outside your comfort zone, knowing that it's only going to hurt? We've all asked ourselves these types of questions at one time or another. And in chapter 7, the answer is given. The first reason being the heart of God. In verse, verses 7 to 16, we are told the story of Joseph, an Old Testament character who was rejected by his brothers. In verses 20 to 45, we are told, told the story of Moses, Israel's old leader, who was rejected by God's people as well. And yet, how do both of these stories end? We'll look at verses 11 to 14 in chapter 7. The story of Joseph. A famine had struck all of Canaan. Joseph's brothers were suffering and in need. Jacob unknowingly sends his sons to their brother Joseph. What happens next? Joseph rejecting those who rejected him? No. Verse 14. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family. Joseph brought them to Egypt where they would have food. In other words, Joseph looked on those who had rejected him with mercy. And then God used Joseph to save them as well. After Moses is appointed leader of Israel, Moses does the same. We see this in verses 19 to 36. Israel, we're told, suffered as slaves in Egypt. Egypt. Then God sends Moses to bring them out. First, they reject the idea of Moses being their leader. Second, they sack him and ask Aaron to lead them instead. How does it all end? With Moses rejecting those who rejected him? Verse 35. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you, let you ruler and judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. Despite his rejection, Moses continued to serve Israel. 
God then used Moses to save them as well. And notice in verse 35 that Stephen replaces the word judge with redeem. With, with redeem. 35, then Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer. When you redeem something, you pay a price to bring something back. And this was certainly true of both Moses and Joseph. Both paid a price as they played their part in serving God's people. And I don't think we can expect anything different. As Stephen continues in verse 52, Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? All those who spoke God's message to the world have been persecuted. If you share something about Jesus, you can also expect to say, pay some kind of price. The price of effort, or the price of rejection, or the price of our comfort. But though our gut reaction to all this is to risk nothing, spare ourselves, stay silent, the heart of God is different. Verse 52. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? Then they even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now they have betrayed and murdered him. After a history littered with examples of the Jews rejecting those who God sent to them. God sent them yet another person. His son. God continuing to reach out to humanity despite their rejection and despite the great cost to himself. For the sake of those who would be saved, God was willing to pay this kind of price. I suspect that, if you are a Christian, you are glad that God did this. God, you are probably glad that God and Jesus were willing to pay the price to save and redeem you let that soak in Jesus was willing to pay the price to save you and now God calls you and I to have the same heart for others to continue to speak to people about Jesus even though doing so comes with a cost if we're focused on results we won't do this Stephen's story reminds us that we might invest much and see no return. If we're focused on ourselves, we won't do this. Stephen's story reminds us that speaking for Jesus comes with a cost. Instead, only when we focus on and appreciate God's heart for the lost, will we be willing to follow in the steps of God's Son. But this passage not only teaches us about the heart of God, it also teaches us about the heart of unbelief. We begin chapter 7 with the high priest asking Stephen the question, Are these charges true? Stephen had been accused of speaking ne negatively about Moses and the temple. And in chapter 7, after speaking positively about both, Stephen proves that, proves that these accusations are lies. And yet, this is how the story ends. At this, they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. In the Sanhedrin, the Jewish equivalent of a courtroom, the place where the truth is supposedly sought after, they covered their ears. Why? Not because what they heard wasn't true, but because they didn't like it. What truth is it that they didn't like? What is at the heart of all unbelief? Both, Mo both the story of Joseph, Moses and Jesus reveal the answer. Genesis 37 verse 8 Joseph's brothers said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? Acts 7 verse 27 
The man who was mistreating the other pushed Moses aside and said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Verse 52. They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one, and now they have betrayed and murdered him. I don't have time to go into all three stories, but in each there is a common theme. People don't like the idea of anyone ruling over them. That's why children rebel against their parents. That's why workers like it when their boss is off. That's why the idea that there is a God is consistently opposed. We want to be our own boss. We want to decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. We want to be accountable to no one but ourselves. And because the message about God and Jesus get in the way of this, the consistent response is this. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him. The people covered their ears because they didn't like what they heard. The people yelled at the top of their voice because they didn't have a good enough an argument to deny it. The people killed Stephen because they'd already decided what they wanted to believe. In other words, the heart of an unbelief is not a lack of education or a lack of logic or a lack of knowledge. The heart of those you know will not change through you simply giving better explanations or more persuasive arguments for the truth. Instead, at the heart of all unbelief is an unwillingness and an inability to see the truth. Firstly, unwillingness. We read in the book of Ephesians, they are darkened, that is unbelievers, are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. That's unwillingness, now inability. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. That's the theology of unbelief. At the heart of all unbelief is an unwillingness and an inability to see the truth. That's the theology of unbelief. But what's the practical response? Basically, the role of a Christian is more than that of an Olympic swimming lifeguard. Basically, if you're a lifeguard at the Olympics, you can afford to sit on your hands all day long. Why can they afford to do nothing? Because the people in the pool have more than enough ability to save themselves. And yet the unbelief in the human heart is so strong, people don't have the ability to save themselves from it. As it says in the book of Jeremiah, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. At the Olympics, the people in the pool have more than enough ability to save themselves. For this reason, Olympic lifeguards can afford to sit on their hands all day. They simply need to tell the swimmers if a shark enters the pool. But the hardness of the human heart is such that we cannot, as Christians, just tell people the gospel. We cannot just tell people the gospel and spend the rest of the day sitting on our hands. Instead, we need to be lifting up our hands to God in prayer. The only one who can deal with and change the force of unbelief in the human heart. Thankfully, changing hearts is something God promised he would do. It says in the book of Ezekiel, I will remove from them their hearts of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Changing hearts is something God promised he would do. Changing his hearts is something God has done for you if you are a believer says in 2 Corinthians that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel. But, Paul continues, God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts. Thankfully, changing hearts is something God has done for you. And changing hearts is something God did in this passage. Saul, who we see so forcefully opposing the gospel about Jesus in chapter 8, 
is seen, seen proclaiming that same message by chapter 9. Changing hearts is something God has done and something God still does. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. In other words, we, when we, we need to not only speak the gospel to others, we need to pray to God that God will change people's hearts and cause them to respond. So, the heart of God, the heart of unbelief, and thirdly and finally, the heart of the persecuted. Now, I'm sure you've all walked through North Shields Town Centre and heard some kids say words that you'd rather not repeat. For example, swear words or some rude terminology. You can tell from their age that these words and terms aren't their own. They pick them up after spending time with someone else. Perhaps their parents or some adult TV program or some older kids. Now let's listen into the last words of Stephen and see if we can work out who he's been spending time with. Who's influenced Stephen and caused him to speak like this? Chapter 7, verse 57. They all rushed at Stephen, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Continues, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. These words, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. These words didn't originate in Stephen. For the natural, normal, human response to stoning is words that I cannot repeat in church. Instead, the words Stephen spoke in the face of total rejection were the result of spending time with Jesus. For Stephen's words were an almost exact copy of the words spoken by Jesus Christ on the cross. Luke 23. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Despite being mocked, despite being rejected, Despite having nails hammered into his hands, despite all this, Jesus is still longing for the salvation of the people right in front of him. And despite who we are, sinners, Jesus never shifted from longing for the salvation of you and I. And it's because Stephen had spent time with Jesus, remembering what Jesus did for him, that he responded in the same way. Stephen didn't cross these people's people off his prayer list. Stephen was still praying for those who rejected him with his last breath. Stephen didn't spill out with swear words or anger when he was hurt. Instead, what spilt out was a continued longing for his persecutor's salvation. After wasting his time and words on a crowd who weren't interested, what did Stephen do? not give up or remain silent. Instead, Stephen used his last few seconds to speak yet more words to God on their behalf. This kind of response isn't natural. It can't be rehearsed or manufactured or faked. Instead, only if we spend time with Jesus, remembering what he did for us, will we respond in the same way. So, Next time you find yourself debating why you should waste time praying for and longing for the salvation of others, ask yourself this. Why should God have spent time and effort on saving you? Why should he have paid the price of his own son? In the word of the song, why should I gain from his reward 
I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart. He willingly paid my ransom.